Brianna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I think I'm more nervous than you are right now. Um, oh, really? Yes. How and I, I think the reason why is, when, well, when you reached out to me, I think I was falling asleep in bed when I saw your message come through. And I'm like, I swear to God, the universe just put you in my lap. Because I remember reading what happened to you and my heart breaking for you. And I obviously it wasn't at that time where I'm like, she should be on the podcast. But at that time, like, like she has a story and I eventually want to talk to her. And then you ended up reaching out to me. So I'm like this whole time. I'm like, I just want to do this conversation justice for you and for everyone. Oh, thank you so much. I, I feel like I honestly don't even deserve to be on this book. What? <laughs> Well, that, that's um, a topic in itself. Right. No, when I reached out to you, it was, I guess it kind of goes back to like the imposter syndrome thing. I was like, who do I think I am? But then I was like, no, you know what? This year I've done a lot of things completely out of my comfort zone more than any other year. I think if you waited yeah. one more day, it would have been me reaching out to you. So don't worry. <laughs> Maybe the universe is just being like, get through this imposter syndrome right now. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I believe in the universe and it works in crazy ways. So now being a new realtor, is that where you're feeling a lot of imposter syndrome? Some of it for sure. Why? And probably most of it. Yeah, I don't know why, honestly, but it kind of goes back to like the who do I think I am? You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to be this, I don't know, sophisticated, like educated. And I know I am, but I'm getting used to communicating with people and feeling confident in everything I'm saying. Like, did I say that properly? Did I explain that right? Do they trust where I'm coming from? Yeah. yeah. And it's hard not to for the first little bit. And I feel like for your first few interactions with clients, like it's likely to suck, but it has already, I've been doing it a couple of months down. It's already improved. So I think it's just getting out of my comfort zone. I feel that because half the time, especially even as a new real estate agent, you know more than the person you're probably working with, but there's still a lot you don't know. And it's you're only going to learn it through experience and through showing the property and through going through like the similar types of questions. And do you find yourself even a few months into it? You're like, damn, I know a lot. Like you could probably train someone now. Yeah, definitely. I do know a lot more than I think I know. And I always surprise myself. And of course, being on a team is an amazing resource that I'm just lucky to have. Erin, she's the our team lead. She's been amazing. Like she's walked me through every step of it, mm -hmm. every process and everything I've had to learn so far and do. And I credit so much of like just my success, my getting back up this year and going after it, even though it's been a really tough year. I credit it a lot to her and the girls on the team because they're honestly just so inspiring. <laughs> I bet. We're all very like minded and growth mindset type of people. Yeah. So it's, it's made a huge, it's like a game changer being surrounded by people like that daily, mm -hmm. I feel like. Yeah. I find with a lot of clients though, the right clients for you aren't expecting you to know it all. But I think what comes through from you is the genuineness. So that's what they're going to jump on, you know, and I find I'm a big believer that there's a client for everyone. There's an agent for everyone. And it's you're going to attract the type of clients that like just care about your genuine heartedness and the the knowledge will come, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of thing that I look for in people, no matter what type of relationship it is. It's like if it's a friendship or a coworker relationship. Like I gravitate to people who I can feel relatable to and like a genuine connection with. So I'm sure I know that most people think the same way. Like if you feel like you're genuinely cared for and cared about, then you're taking care of kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you bought a home in the last couple of years, but if you were working with an agent that was a bit of a know-it-all and like there was never any room for you to ask any questions and there was like, you'd be turned off by that anyways. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For I, would sure. hate <laughs> I would hate that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would not consider myself a know-it-all at all. I'm only just getting to know you. I only know you through cute pictures of you and Tyler. And I just always thought you were like this sweet person. I have no worries of you succeeding in this business. Trust me, like none. Yeah, I read. I don't even know if I can repeat the quote. It was just like, as long as you're coming from a genuine place, you don't have to worry. You're covered every time. Like 100%. no matter what. Yeah. But you know, deep down, you're going to be successful. 
Yeah, mean? definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's all. Yeah. That's all that you need. Yeah, I have the drive, like the fire inside of me, and everything. Yeah. And like I have had real estate in the back of my mind since I've been twenty years old. I've uh, had careers that I did not like or did was didn't feel passionate about. Worked some jobs, I guess, not careers, but jobs before I started working here and. Even the job I had previously, I won't say where, but I felt I hated it. Like I felt <laughs> like it was a toxic environment. There was a lot of toxic energy. Every time I come home, I just would feel drained. Even Tyler could feel that off of me. Which is not good for your relationship. And no, exactly. And since I was that job, I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do anyway, but I didn't know what I wanted to do was the problem. Like I kind of felt like it was still real estate. But when I was like 20 years old, I was like, who am I to be a realtor? I'm like, I just didn't have that mindset back then. But yeah, this last year, even though it's been really hard, I still was able to recognize that I needed more. And I was already here. So I was already working here even before my dad passed away. So I honestly feel like it was kind of I'm not religious, like, but I'm more spiritual. And I do feel like God kind of put me in that place because I needed to be here when that happened, when I went through that chapter in my life. And I well, imagine if you were at the other job, do you think you'd be honestly, as no, strong as you I would have gone now? out on stress leave. 100%. <laughs> I really think I would have. Yeah. Yeah. So Which is scary to think about. I want to start by jumping into it based on the first time I heard about it. So obviously, the first time I heard about you losing your dad was through the Facebook post that you wrote that Tyler shared. And like I said at the beginning, my heart broke for you. And I want to read a little bit of a paragraph from that to really set the stage, if you're okay. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So it was a fantastic post, by the way. I think there's there's thousands and thousands of shares on it and so many comments. Like You can tell that you and your dad are very loved like within the community, within family and friends, like that's not hard to notice. But you said in your post, May 10th, 2021, my dad took his own life. I have a lot of questions. I think I always will. My dad definitely suffered from depression probably most of his life. And no, it wasn't obvious. He had a lot to be proud of. He laughed a lot. He was kind to everyone. He had so many friends and he was always the life of the party. Every single person that knew him loved him. And there was no shortage of love. You said, if love alone could have saved my dad, he'd still be here with us. And let me ask you this. Is that the hardest part, thinking about all of it? Yeah, definitely. Like, he, it's all still very confusing. And fresh. Um, Yes, still fresh, for sure. But, like, I think the thing about grief is that, like, first of all, I never knew really what grief truly was until I went through this I've lost grandparents I've had losses before but I didn't know like anything like this before yeah so the thing with grief I've learned is just that like a million emotions can exist at once Mm -hmm. and it's very confusing I felt really just confused hurt heartbroken betrayed like just all the feelings Well, you said every single emotion of this grieving process is so real. You said you feel numbness, confusion, anger, sadness, grief, and a lot of regret. Um, And it it is sad to me, like, that I guess my dad didn't realize how loved he was because he was. He was very, like, a very popular guy. A lot of people, like, knew my dad. Like, I'd go out places or parties and, like, I'd run into people, um, oh, I work with your dad. Like, I was an apprentice for your dad. Like, he's such a great guy. I love him. Like, I always love working with him. And just nothing I've never in my whole life of growing up ever heard anyone say anything negative about him. Like, he just had a good energy about him. You would just never know. Like, you would have never known. I knew he had his um, demons, I guess. Like, I knew that he struggled with alcoholism. Because I saw it growing up. But of course, you wouldn't know. Like, you'd just think he was like the life of the party. He was having a good time, but you wouldn't know that that was like something that was eating him up. Because when people are alcoholics or like, just like mm-hmm. any other addiction or addicts, they can't just have one. It turns into, you know, they're up all night drinking themselves till they like essentially fall asleep or yeah. pass out. And that was a lot of what I saw growing up. 
and that was the primary reason for my parents' divorce as well. And they divorced when I was in grade 12. So yeah, that was a lot of what I saw growing up. So to me, like seeing my dad drinking was like a, a trigger for me. And I knew that he had mental health issues, I guess, um, but more so the last couple of years, it, mm -hmm. it got worse. But I wasn't living with him anymore. So it was hard for me to see everything that was going on. Because obviously, if this is something that you grew up with, you always have in the back of your mind that you're semi-worried, don't you? Yes, absolutely. So let me ask you this, and this might be a tough question. When this happened, when you got the call, were you shocked? No, I was not shocked overly. I mean, of course, you're a little shocked. But not you're not shocked happened. that it happened. This is the thing, like how I found out my mom called me in the middle of the night. It was Mother's Day. It was like a Sunday night overnight. I think she called me about two in the morning. I answered the phone and I just heard my mom asking me if Tyler was awake. But I could instantly hear in her voice as soon as she spoke that I, I knew he had died. She didn't have to say anything else. Like I just knew he was gone as soon as she spoke. And it was like an intuition thing. Like I just knew. And then. I said, why? What happened? What happened? And I was just begging her to tell me, like, what happened? Just don't, like, prolong it. She's like, is Tyler up? Is he up? Can you please make sure he's awake? And Tyler had woken up at that point. And she said, like, dad died. And I just gave the phone to Tyler. And I think I just crouched down. But I didn't cry or anything. And I didn't ask how. Like, I knew it was, you knew, I knew he had completed suicide. I didn't ask how he died. She said she was coming over right now, like her and um, her boyfriend, Steve, were getting in the car. And uh, I was just unable to respond to her. So I think at this point, it was Ty Tyler doing all of the talking. And she drove from her house to our house. And in between that time, you know, if somebody passes away, a lot of the time people are just, like, well, what happened? How did I just knew? And then she showed up and got in bed with me. And then we, we started talking and then. I just said, how did he do it? And that was like, I you, knew. But you knew. Yeah. What are, what are the immediate emotions? Obviously, it's shock, but it almost seems like you're going numb. Yeah. Numb was the biggest one. Like, I couldn't even feel anything. It just felt, I don't even know. I don't even know. It felt like the world was like spinning. Like, it was weird. It was a weird feeling. I've never felt anything like that. And that's the one that gets me. It's. At our age, we've lost grandparents. We've may maybe know people our age that have died and stuff, but it's when someone's that close to you and it, it's, it's a different sadness. It's a sadness that's really, really deep. And I don't know, do you feel like, do you run through the emotions of like, is there something I could have done? Was there something I could do? Like, what do I do now? Like, how do I move on? Like, what are the questions you're asking yourself? Yeah, definitely. How do I move on? Is it a huge one? Because I'm trying to move on. I think everybody has seen me doing my best to move on. And but I don't want to leave it all behind either. I don't want to like forget. Like I never will forget. But I don't want to just, you know, move on to the point where I feel like I'm pushing it off and not remembering him. And and that's never going to be true. But I've been going to therapy, grief counseling since it's happened. And that's a big thing we talk about is that it was not mine or anyone else's responsibility or mm. fault. Did you he, need to hear that? Like, were you thinking that at first? I really didn't feel okay. like it was my fault. No, I didn't feel like it was my fault. But I do think that he, he felt like everybody else was going to be better off without him, including me. I felt like he thought he was hindering my growth. And like, I'm kind of at the point now where... I've started my own life and and you you were right when you said earlier that when you know somebody in your life struggles and battles with mental health or addiction that you're always kind of worrying about them and I feel like he knew I worried about him and I feel like he just felt like he was hindering me and holding everybody in his life back mm. like I can't confirm but I'm sure he I, I know he felt like that and was also dealing with a lot of his own problems. It's been a hard year with COVID and everything, or a couple of years, I guess now. He was laid off because there was just a lack of 
work at the, he worked at the refinery in St. John. So a lot of people experienced that layoff, but this, yeah, he had, you know, lack of routine and he was a man that like, just liked to be busy and like to be doing that something. And he, I can understand even for me, if I, you know, was off work for almost, I don't know, most, most of the year he was off work for, I, that would be hard. I would need to find something to distract me. And then when you're dealing with all of that and he was kind of in a, like a toxic relationship, I guess that right. would be hard too. That would be hard. So I understand that it wasn't my fault. And I also understand that there was nothing I could have done about it because at the end of the day, I have my own house and, yeah. you know, I can't go back. I can't go to my dad's house every night to check in and mm-hmm. say, are you okay? And quite frankly, he would never have wanted me to be doing that. So, well, you said you often asked and he would just say, I'm good, kid. Yeah. And I only needed to read that text to understand all the emotion behind that, let alone yeah. hearing it from him. Yeah, he did have a suicidal attempt um, the the fall with like September, I guess. Like six September months of, before? Or, yeah, yeah six, that. eight months before. Yeah. So that was kind of also how I knew, like, you know, that it was when he had passed that it was for that reason. Or what has changed in your mind of what you knew about suicide and loss before and now that you're experiencing it yourself? What has changed? A lot of misconceptions. You don't understand it completely until you really go through it and you can try to understand it, but you're not going to feel the direct feelings that you would feel if you're a suicide loss survivor. And that's just people that don't go through that are just lucky. I mean, it, it's, I, I don't consider it selfish. I know a lot of people kind of jump to like, well, how could they leave their family like that? I don't consider it selfish at all. I don't think in that moment that they're contemplating taking their life. I don't think they're thinking about anything other than the fact that they just need a way out. And I don't think that it's them making a decision. I think that their mental illness is making that decision for them. Yeah, just so much has changed. I think a lot about like his last moments. That's one of the big things I struggle with was thinking. Just keep thinking about that over and over again. What did that look like for him? What did that look like? Because obviously there's suffering, but you can't see it. It's not like a physical illness where you're in a hospital bed like it it's not this, the same so what what did that look like for him like how bad was it how bad was he hurting it, and that's ultimate... that's why it's it, it it's harder on the heart because you can't see the deterioration yeah yeah and how long was it there for like I know it was there a while but how how long really could have been you know a lot longer than any of us knew mental but, health um, support on the east coast is very well known for being crap. <laughs> And then you add on mental health for men and adult men. That's also crap. We have two losing sides here. So even if your dad wanted help, well, where is he getting it? Right. Like when he was in the hospital back the first attempt, he he didn't really receive help. He he was in the hospital for about four days, I want to say, four or five days. Why? Um, Yeah. And. And when they sent him in the hospital for four days, yeah, they did a psych evaluation on him and that was it. (laughs) Like, there you go. No follow up, nothing. He wasn't necessarily the type that would be banging on the door being like, I need help, mental health help. Absolutely not. Not many people are. Not very many people would. Well, you have you have a generation, an older generation. You have a man and you have a man from the East Coast who's like, it, mental health and therapy, there's not a tons of places around the block saying, come in, come in, you know? Yeah. yeah so. And the, he doesn't follow the stuff that we follow where I, I feel like if we open Instagram right now, it's like all people talking about mental health and self-care and everything. He, that's not what his yeah his and reality is. It's becoming a more talked about now with our generation. You're right. And I follow a lot of pages like regarding mental health, but that's just me. But you're right. Like it's more in your face. So, you know, it's like, okay, but nothing was getting in his face saying that, like nothing. And I guess this might be a little part of where I could say that I blame myself a bit for not telling him that, like vocalizing, like, it's okay. You need to know that it's okay, that you're not like, okay, obviously. But, and I did, I said, after I was so worried about you, like, that was scary. Please, you know, tell us. 
and he did not want to talk about it. It was, but you're right. He's a man. It's not common for men to be vulnerable and mm. somebody at his age, like that is supposed to be a father, you know, he's a father figure and everything. And I know a lot of parents don't like that their kids to see them hurt, of course. but I did what I knew what to do at the time. And I asked him if he was okay. And he would say, I'm a good kid every time. And yeah, he didn't have a really supportive partner in that regard. When he did have his first suicide attempt, she wasn't even going to call me or tell me. And Fuck. when when I found out through other sources. You are angry. Yeah. And I asked her what happened to him. And she told me it was a, a heart attack. That he had a heart attack. And then when I found out that he had actually taken a a whole bunch of pills and he had been drinking at the same time she told me to never ever tell my mother that for one and to never ever tell anybody because he would be humiliated and I know he would be but he not. would be or she would be both I think honestly both of them but I think there's so much shame I don't know I'm not sure why she carried so much shame with it yeah I don't know because that's a mystery to me I never really knew her like I n never knew her to that extent because mm -hmm. we never had that breakthrough. She didn't want me around a lot. So me and my dad kept our relationship very separate from his relationship with her. So and there begins to divide. Be like that. Yeah. And there's a divide. And that's hard on him, too. Like, you know, that's hard on anybody. Like there was a lot of factors playing into it. And I think that's another thing that people don't understand is it's not just a one be all and all one thing. It's a million little things that just add up. The shame that she is creating around it, that hurts a lot. So it's, you put yourself in that shoe. So if his immediate partner is creating this shame cloud around this, who else does he have to turn to? Yeah, exactly. Who That's can you be open one. with if the person that you're supposed to feel the most safe with is embarrassed yeah. by this? Yeah. And I think she was right in the fact that he was going to, because he was kind of essentially in a delirium for a few days. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't speak for himself and he couldn't tell us that. Like he, he didn't know what he was talking about when I showed up to the hospital. So it was just her telling me, hush. And he found out, you know, he, he kind of came back from that. That's what somebody's in your ear telling you, you know, nope, don't worry. Nobody knows. Like it, adds to the stigma that we all want mm -hmm. to break and I guess that's another reason why I was not super surprised when he passed how does that silence make you feel where someone's telling you shut up about this don't talk about it don't make it a thing I was mad I was really mad at I, of course I told people who were close to me at the time like I wasn't going to listen to her but yeah, I felt really mad about it, honestly. I remember vocalizing that to Tyler, just saying, like, who does she think she is? Mm -hmm. But we tried to create a positive. I remember going there for supper a couple of days later, which typically I wouldn't go over there for supper with her because... You'd go out with your dad. Go out with my dad or he would come. He visited us quite a bit yeah. at our house. And we just kept, like I said, kept our relationship lives. kind of separate from her because... She was toxic in my a toxic energy person. So, do you have siblings? No, I'm an only child. So, me too. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. I assumed you, you were. Yeah. So, do you feel like, do you almost wish you had a sibling to carry on this burden yes. or help with this burden? Yeah. Absolutely. I never really wanted or cared. I never thought about it much, like growing up, but now I do. I think about it more now as an adult. Yeah, I wish I had a sibling. Oh, yeah, trust me. My parents also divorced in grade 12, and I'm also an only child. And there was many years after my mom and dad's divorce where my me and my dad were a little estranged. And I, 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 I'm not going to lie and say these are things that I worried about. So and I think when I saw your post immediately, like it brought back a lot of emotions and fears and worries and things are a lot better now. But yeah, I understand like, the relationship that you have with your dad like I get it yeah wow that's great I didn't know that but yeah mm. the, the the parallels are a little freaky in my opinion okay. one word that you said earlier that I really want to ask you more about is you said you felt betrayal do you want yeah. to expand on that that's an interesting word choice I did feel betrayal you feel guilty for feeling that way a little 
not mm-hmm. really. No, okay, I will. Good. I will lean more towards no because after he passed away, I was left to deal with a lot of things that I didn't expect to have to deal with, like his estate, his house, and he fought me on it badly. You're fucking kidding me. Yeah, she she did. She sued me for his house. And I know that's going on a podcast and I don't care. She, I don't care. She forged like after his first suicide attempt. She filled out the form in her own handwriting. And I don't know if he signed it or if she forged his signature. But she signed his pension and she signed me off of his beneficiary that I was on for t- about 20, you know, whatever, 25 years. And the day or two after she he passed, she was on the phone with the insurance company, his union, saying that she needs the money like immediately. So she knew that that money was there for her when he passed. So I was left to deal with a lot of things. And of course, you know, I, I'm not a hateful person. And that's another thing. I'm trying to work on forgiveness through this because... How do you? I need oh my to. God. <laughs> but how do you? And how do you move I'd on? I'd be fueled with poison. It's hard. It's hard not to be. I've been trying really hard not to be. How legally this, like, I don't know if like this is the right question to ask, but legally, how does she, how is she able to do that? Don't Um, they have to call you as well? Right. They didn't just because it was. Were they married? No, they were not married. Yeah. How does she have any right to kind of change anything? Right. Well, it's because he said the signature of his was, was there, but. But you said she forged it or you believe it or she did. She may have forged it, but if he had assigned it, I think he was either not in the right state of mind, drunk, or in the hospital. So, yeah. There's a lot of weird motives here. Yeah, so I guess the most important part for me is at this point just moving on, trying not to be mad at my dad for leaving me with, like, this type of mess to, Mm -hmm. you know, deal with after his death because I'm grieving and I'm trying to just grieve and I'm also dealing with a lot of things that a 26 year old wouldn't have to deal with like selling his house and it's yeah that's not the listing you want is it Brianna oh it wasn't my list I did Aaron did it for me thank god but yeah yeah no not the not my first listing that and it could have been but it wasn't gonna be oh yeah, yeah and that is that would be a weird position to be in Right. A lot of people Very were like, sad. are you going to sell your dad's house? And I was like, no, of course not. That's crazy. Yeah, that's really weird. Yeah. I, I have a friend who also lost his dad when he was in his 20s. And that was the biggest thing he said was the mess that you have to clean up later in terms of paperwork and documents. He he also said, he's like, I never like you you think if you, if you lose a parent or lose someone close to you, you just want to be given the time to grieve. And you got to kind of go into a mode of admin work. Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, wait, what? Like, I didn't do any of this. And did he end up having to be the sole administrator as well? Of- I don't, I, I can't answer that because I don't know. Um, but I think he, from what I gather, he probably definitely took the brunt of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something, even when my dad passed away, it's not something I thought, I didn't even think about it until all of a sudden you're in the middle of it. You're getting mail and like, you're having to call these places and shut down his credit cards and call the bank and try to get everything you know switched into my name now and it's it's crazy like so yeah of course I wish I wasn't an old child anymore what does that look like because okay so he has obviously life insurance I'm gonna ask you like logistical questions now obviously he has life insurance obviously he has his union pension I don't know maybe he has debt is all that coming into your name right now well the life insurance and the pension went into her name because she signed it you know, so that's it, actually so how it went down. It. Yeah, but luckily he didn't have very much debt at all. So, so that she's was... she's collecting all that money right now. Yeah, he's just collecting. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you you're, you got no money out of all this. The house, which took me six months to get her out of, and she lived for free. And <laughs> she and I had to go to court to get her to get out of the house. So I had to pay lawyer fees and I had to pay you know, things to get her to believe. I'm so angry for you right now. How does someone have the audacity to like fight you on any of that? Don't know. And that's the thing I've sort of talked about with my therapist. Like there's people out there and they're not good. And, you know, there's evil out there. And there's yes. narcissistic people out there that believe that everything's out of them. And that there's, there's people out there that you just cannot reason 
but like no matter what you do, you'll never be able to get through to them. Yeah. Because they they're self serving. And yeah, unfortunately that was the reality that my dad was living with somebody like that. And how I long how long were they together? Oh, five years. So yeah. Maybe. And so you 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 gave up fighting her on it? Yeah, I think that now now it's kind of at a in a lull. I would say if she she does want money from the sale of the house, that I'm not giving her anything. So we'll see if she comes back at any point to bother me. But I'm I'm in a good place now where I'm trying now to move on, and it's becoming easier. Summer was when things were very stressful. I was going through the middle of just all of. And I took two months off in the summer to study for my exam. And so I was studying and I was going through all this and I was sitting home every day, like with my books, just trying to keep focused. And it was, it's impossible. It was hard. Yeah. But I was like, I need to do this for me. Like, I need to do this for my dad. This is what he would want for me. And don't like, you know, it was a constant battle. Don't let all of this take it the best of me. A lot of pressure. Yeah, I, I remember, obviously, I'm not going through anything like you went through when I was studying for my exams. But even just like, as well, I was studying for my exams during the pandemic. Even just that, I was like, this is such an annoying added level of stress, let alone going through the death of my dad and fighting his partner over insurance claims. Like, go fuck yourself. Like, I, that's a lot of pressure as a 20-year-old. You feel a little bit... I don't want to use the word bratty, but it's just like, can I just focus on my own life? Like I'm trying to start this career and just let me live. But then this all this like adulting is thrown on you and then there's no one to share the the grief with. Yeah, definitely. Like you're expected to do it all. Yeah. I feel sorry for my mom because of course my mom, she's grieving. It's a little yeah. looks a little different with her because she was still with your dad for almost 20 years. I hadn't talked in a quite a few years like they didn't still grief but there was days where like she's calling me and she's like did you get this taken care of have you heard anything on this and I told had to tell her just go just don't talk to me about it for a little while because I need to focus on me and I probably did sound bratty at the time but and I felt bad you know telling her but I'm trying to focus on this right now I'm trying to focus on my career my personal growth and I just need to have a break for a day I can't listen Mm -hmm. to anything else and yeah, and she, she, luckily I do have an amazing support system. Yeah. That's one thing like I would have never got through without Tyler and without my mom and uh, my coworkers and my friends. Mm-hmm. But like it, there was talk, days where I had to shut it down. Talk to me a little bit more about that, your support system. So how has this affected your friendships? How like did it affect your relationship at all? And then another part of that question, is there anyone that wasn't there for you? that you're surprised about? Yeah, definitely. That's a good question. It, uh, luckily, I I will say that the, that the friends who I know are my friends and have been in my life for all of the years that they have been, they've remained. Like, they haven't been shaken by anything. And Tyler's the same. He has been an amazing partner. He's a, just an amazing person, as you know. Like, he doesn't understand it, which is fair, because he hasn't don't want him it. to on the level that I have he's mm-hmm. been by my side while I've gone through it and he's he's had to grieve like he knew my dad they worked together even he always says that he had a hard time going back to work after that and seeing the red truck like my dad had a red truck and he'd for, have to remind himself like oh it's not his truck like he's he's not here you know and so he was grieving too but he's held on and he's tried and he's read about grief and he's done his research to help be able to be there for me offered to go to great counseling with me and that's how you know like he's a good one I guess but and so um, I was just gonna say that yeah but there was a couple particular people in my life who they weren't my best friends but they were friends who I was like that's weird they haven't reached out to me like not that I thought everyone needed to reach out to me and be right there but people who you know I would have reached out to them like it you, you it notice just, you notice people who are absent during time like that for sure are yeah, you friends with those people anymore or you've mm-hmm. kind of distanced yourself since myself I wouldn't say like we're on bad there's no bad blood but I noticed and Do you think they feel the distance most likely yeah and you notice the people 
who even have given their condolences, you notice if they're uncomfortable with the terms of his death or not. If you can feel that energy. How does that make you feel? Uncomfortable, I think. Like, because I don't want to make other people uncomfortable. And I've been open about this since day one. And that was a choice I made. And some people, if they can't be open back about it, it makes me feel that there should be shame. I know there isn't and there shouldn't be. Why do you think people are so uncomfortable about it? And why do you think they're they're trying to give you their condolences and they're they're the awkward ones? Like, I, it almost takes away from your own grief and their, their condolences. Hey, it does. Yeah. There's people who like I can be around and if I have a thought about my dad or like something or the the whole situation, if something comes on my head, I can just say it to them and I don't feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that around them or whatever. It's just normal. But other people you feel you're trying to manage your own emotions around them for their own comfort. Yes. I hate that. Exactly. How has your mom's grief looked differently? My mom is like an incredibly strong woman. She's just always been that way. She's, I have not seen my mom cry very many times in my life. Yeah, she's, she doesn't show that she's hurting, but you know she is. But she won't put her grief ahead of mine. I've even invited her to come to counseling, and I think she's going to, which is great. She's warming um, up to it. Because I think you need to talk to somebody, too. Yeah, she knows she does, but she if she's having a bad day, she'll do anything to, you know, she won't tell me. because She'll ignore it. Mm-hmm, yeah, she's been like that my whole life. She's been like that through everything, and she's just always made sure everything will be taken care of. Where do you get these characteristics for you? If you're very open about your emotion, you're you were the first to be like, I got to go to grief counseling. You post it right away to explain what's going on. Where are you getting that? Do you get that? From, you don't get that from either of your parents. Likely, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I don't know where I get that. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm strong like my mom and I carry like I'm I'm sensitive. I'm a pretty sensitive person. I'm like, I do wear my heart on my sleeve. So I don't know where that comes from. I was really close with my grandmother. She was kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds like you had no shame around going to grief counseling. Yeah. No, not at all. Right away you went. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think it's a generational thing that we're just so used to like that being an option for us? Maybe. But I've been trying to figure that out this whole time. (laughs) Did you have any reservations about going? No, no. Really? I, I was very open to going to counseling after it happened because I hate being in a bad place. Like, I yeah. hate, I've I've dealt with, you know, my anxiety, like I've had anxiety in the past and I would even go as far to say that I've had some depression in the past. There's been days where I just didn't like want to get up or like I've been really sad all day and I just could not shake it no matter what. Like, sometimes I feel a little guilty saying that because I know people have battle it worse and I've battled it too and I've been on antidepressants for a couple of years and that keeps me really balanced but I hate being in a bad place like god forbid I forget to take one of my medications one night I know the next day I'm like oh like am I gonna be moody today like you'll feel it right away yeah I hate being off balance so Mm. I just didn't want to be in in that place for very long like I knew I needed to wait it out and grieve and feel the emotions as they came but I didn't want to be like that every day so I was open to literally anything that would help me come out of this space where I had to be for lack of a better word miserable (laughs) I didn't want to be like that no because you're you're smart enough to know that that's not productive yeah and you don't seem like the type person that wants to sit in misery ever no I don't at all I want to be happy so I yeah. do everything I can to try to give myself that life. And yeah, I I feel like nobody around me wants to see me like that either. And then I don't want to rub negative energy onto other people. And I don't know. I've been trying to figure that th- out this whole time, how I was so quick to know like that I had to do this. I had to do this for my mental sanity and I just did it. But there has been bad days. <laughs> Not to say there's been no bad days, but there has <laughs> Well, you said a quote that resonated with you was, I gave myself care when it wanted destruction, and that's when my healing began. So you went into action mode right away to try to fix things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
What's something in grief counseling or maybe ways of coping, whatnot, that have kind of surprised you? So I have a good friend that went through something similar, not similar, I guess. She lost her mom before a couple of days before I lost my dad. And oh, wow. And I bet both of your journeys look very different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So she actually sent me a guided journal after my dad passed. Actually, I think it was like for like a thinking of you gift on Father's Day. Yeah. And I started implementing it into my like routine because I wanted to feel better. And I do find journaling helps, which I am surprised about because I wouldn't say I love writing. But yeah, so I started doing that. That helped a lot. And I've learned this from my team, not necessarily from counseling, but coming to work every day and time blocking and being productive. You know, if you have an appointment, make sure you schedule that appointment in priority mode. And so every single day, I've been pretty busy, busy enough to stay happy and stay feeling like purposeful that kind of surprised me I guess just how well I've been able to manage work well it sounds like in a positive way you're busying yourself you're not letting yourself sit with your thoughts in in a bad way the times that you are letting yourself sit with your thoughts you're actively going to grief counseling and therapy to be like let's be productive when we talk about this I don't think you're doing anything wrong I think the way you're describing it you're like You feel weird by saying like, I'm okay and I'm still being productive. It almost seems like you're afraid to say that. Yeah, I know. Why? It does. It's okay to also be okay. I know. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Do you have guilt? Awkward about saying, yeah, I'm doing okay. Um, So how is that going to transpire in your business? Are you going to be afraid to celebrate a success because you lost your dad six months ago and the majority of people think you should just be sitting sad and crying? I don't think so. I think Okay, good. I don't think celebrating my successes has been challenging. If anything, good. everything that I've had to go through in the last six months, first time impossible. Yeah. Don't feel guilty for saying that. You have your own life. Yeah, it's just kind of bizarre that I guess all of this went on around a really exciting time in my life when I was finally feeling really happy in a career and finally feeling really like happy in my personal life and I just feel like I was in a good place and like I didn't want to compromise that but also I was also in a really bad place after this happened and like two can exist at once maybe I don't know Mm -hmm. yeah I mean when it isn't an inconvenient time there's never a convenient time to go through grief yeah it it takes a lot of energy and time and emotions and yeah definitely One thing that I had to talk about in therapy that was on my mind was kind of feeling like I almost feel a sense of peace now. And this is, again, going to sound really horrible to say, but I think people who have been through this can understand kind of like a relief that he is not struggling anymore and kind of a sense of peace because I'm not worried about what's he doing. Like, you know, Friday night, is he okay? How's he making out? I haven't heard from my dad all day. I haven't heard from him this weekend. Like, is everything going on okay in his life? Because since last fall, that had very much been on my mind. As soon as Friday would roll around, because that was when most, you know, when all of his other friends that would come over and they would get the drink going. And, but for them, like, do that and they go home, like, you know, up the street, they go to act in their families. But for my dad, it was like not that simple. Like, he wasn't able to do that. So, well, you were um, grown up. You have, like you said, you had your own life. And I, I didn't want to be thinking about what could happen again. So now, you know, it, it, I wish he was here more than anything, but I don't have that in my mind anymore. So it's like a little bit of a sense of peace. And I talked about that with my mom and with my therapist. And my therapist said that's so normal. It's like something that most people who are, are children of addicts experience it their loved one passes. What's your view on alcohol? Do you drink? Honestly, I used to drink recreationally, just like everyone else on the weekends, or if we had been invited to a party. And I haven't even drank like in the last few months, but I will say it's a trigger for me for sure. Mm -hmm. Like absolutely. There's been times where Tyler has gotten carried away and I did not like it. I explained that to him many times. He's well aware. 
said. Seeing somebody belligerently is, yeah, it's hard for me. Obviously comes from my childhood. Of course. But yeah, it's like no harm can be being done. And I still get like sour. Of course. It's, the word is triggered. Yeah. And I'm sure watching, if, if Tyler is drinking a lot, you grew up with a dad who had alcoholic tendencies. So you're, you're seeing, okay, I'm very serious about this relationship. And, but this is how you're going to sometimes act when you're drinking. I don't want to go down this cycle again. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I know that Tyler doesn't have any like, no, 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 eggs no, no. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you can but, get a glimpse um, of it and you're almost afraid like, it's will it become that? Yeah. Right. And it's just like not entertaining for me to see somebody like, mm. like that. But, it's hard because I don't you know I know it's all it's okay for Mm -hmm. us to let us have a good time that and I used to know and as a kid I mean I did a lot of bad things yeah Yeah. from the east coast you're up to no good I was always up to no good every every I'm still up to no good (laughs) I mean yeah and it's I was at a wedding a couple months ago in in PEI and like I get hammered and I had a great time. But to say it's not a trigger for me when I see like Tyler, mostly him, he gets it. Well, yeah, because it, it's a bit. Be, being an only child, you don't have any brothers. Like Tyler is the next like like main guy in your life now that your dad's gone. So do you feel like he feels that extra pressure? Do you even probably. know you're putting it on there? Probably. He probably does. That's a really good point. I don't, I know I put pressure on him, but I didn't know I, was necessarily putting that pressure on him, but you're probably right. And I probably am. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it'd be natural. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I feel like you're like me, like a bit of a daddy's girl. Oh, yeah, definitely. I was always fighting, fighting with my mom growing up. Me too. We were like too much alike. <laughs> me too. <laughs> and I even think to this day we're still too much alike and like we can't live together, but like we don't live together. So we're just like best friends. But mm-hmm. if I moved in with her tomorrow, we would probably be ready to kill each other. Even when I go home, like more than five days, I'm like, I am going to lose it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, and that, a nice few provinces in between really helps the relationship. Yeah, <laughs> she's gonna listen to this and laugh. <laughs> yes, I want to ask you a few more questions before I let you go. Going through your dad's suicide, and your dad's death, obviously busying yourself with work and starting a new career that definitely helped kind of keep your mind off it. But did anything else give you warmth? Like maybe the messages people were saying about him, like kind of what got you through it? Yeah, definitely. I received so many messages after he passed away. I I always say I'm lucky that my mom, I know she would have been banging on my door anyway, but even if I had my phone, I'm lucky like I heard it from her because I would have, I would have heard it in the morning. I had messages like, Flowing into my inbox in the morning, just people who have like known my dad while he was growing up, people who knew me when I was growing up, neighbors, friends, a lot of coworkers of his that just had like all these amazing stories and just hilarious stories about him, like so many funny ones. This one particular friend of his growing up wrote this long, long post about how she had the biggest crush on my dad when they were younger. I and, like, love that. <laughs> Yeah, we really connected. So, like, it brought a lot of light. It brought some things that I may not have known about him. And I knew I was more cared for than I even realized I was. And that more people were in my corner than I even ever knew. So that did bring some warmth, for sure. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I mean, going through a loss like that, you don't expect people to pop out of the woodwork like that, but they do. And it just showed me how loved my dad was. but. Yeah. I wish he knew that, but I, I think he probably did down, but he one hundred percent did. And I know from what I know about talking to other people about suicide and even people struggling people who have lost people from suicide or people struggling with like mental health themselves, it has nothing to do with anyone else. No. And it, there's no there's no amount of as we said earlier, love is not gonna save someone. It's a lot deeper in that. You know that. You've been on antidepressants and are. You know it's a lot deeper in that. It is it is a chemical imbalance. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like it's not something you control and make a choice about every day. The, like people going through mental health don't, don't wake up and say, I think I'm going to be sad today. I think I'm going to have a struggle state. Like no one wants that. Like that's not what we're choosing. 
And love is not going to change it. It's it's a lot deeper than that is what I'm getting at. Definitely. It definitely you know comes from, yeah, I know that 100%. It comes from an inner place. And I still, you know, I think we all wonder why it has to be, but it's true. It's a chemical imbalance. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a few tougher questions and it's okay if you don't want to answer just to finish it off. Um, for someone in your shoes right now that maybe have recently lost someone from suicide or even just lost a parent in any way or are worried about someone in that kind of situation, what do you want to tell them? I would definitely say to not ever be afraid to talk to them about it. I know it may seem like the person doesn't want to talk about it or feels annoyed by it or embarrassed about it, but I don't know. It could make all of the difference. I would not, never wish the regret and the that feeling on anybody and not to blame yourself. It's not to do with anybody else. It's that person that's carrying those inner demons and those feelings for whatever reason. Oftentimes it has a lot to do with that person's upbringing even and the things they were taught. And you can't control everything. There's no way to control other people and what they do, but you can try to help. How do we get better around the stigma of mental health? And especially, how do we get better at removing the stigma of mental health and emotions in men? I think that we should teach the younger generation, first of all, that from a very young age, that it's okay to have feelings and to be vulnerable and with your feelings and if you're having a tough time come to somebody talk to them about it and be open and I always tell Tyler when we have kids this is going to be something they just grow up knowing like they're never going to have to question us and ask what happened you know they're just going to know that it's just as much of a an illness as anything else and if they can look at it that way then I don't think that there should be that shame associated with it but what about the older generation that's the ones I'm actually worried about more our <laughs> parents age and I, and I, I say this because even the other day, I like, I, I was like kind of joking with my mom and I was like, oh my God, I got to go to therapy. She was like, Jill, why do you have to go to therapy? You don't, you don't need that. You don't need that. It was so like shameful and hush hush. I'm smart enough to know that like, I'm not taking on that energy. I'm like, I'll go. But how do we change what they think about it? Because there's a lot of people our age, Brianna, that worry about our parents. They're becoming empty nesters. We're all moved on with our own life. And a lot of parents who live vicariously through their kids, they're wondering what's next for them. And I think that is like, it sets them up for a lot of like sadness and loneliness. So what do we do? I, that's the generation that I'm worried about. You're right. I'm worried more about them as well. I don't know what we can do for them, but that's a really good question because you're right. They're lonely. I think about my grandmother, for example, like she's a widow now my grandfather's passed and she has a lot of grief that she still lives with every day and she's just one of those people that has to be uh, busier with other people in order to not be sad and I worry about her too at the end of the day I really don't know what I could have done especially when you add in all the factors like the alcohol and the, I guess the financial the thought, loss of course work they all go hand in hand toxic environment I'm not sure what I could have done he had um, all the ingredients right so it's how do you take that away like you can't change somebody's reality they can but you can't control it and you can't help somebody that isn't actively seeking help and so it's hard I don't know my last question for you and don't feel like you have to answer it okay what do you want your dad to know today what is it <laughs> no yeah just I often talk to him a lot, like when I'm in the car, like my thing with him has been rainbows since he's passed away because I just see so many of them. And like the day after he passed, or maybe it was like a day or two, but I saw this like amazing, like double rainbow. And I looked it up because so I was just like, I don't know, at the time I was like, that sign. Like I just, first thing that I thought of was like, is that him trying to communicate with me? So I looked it up and it, Oftentimes, rainbows said that when your loved one gets to heaven, they'll send a rainbow, like where you can see it to let you know that they've made it. And I believe in that stuff. And I always look for rainbows. I always look for dots. 
I still talk to him like when I'm driving in the car all the time. So I'm constantly literally just telling him mostly about like my day or what's bothering me. But like, I just mostly want him to know like I love him. I know he knows that. But and I want to know that he's okay. That's like my biggest thing. After he passed away, Tyler and I, I was always like, can you read me stories of people who have had near-death experiences and have seen heaven and know that so that I know it's real and I know he's there and he's okay. Tyler would literally sit there. I'd be like in the bath and Tyler would be sitting there reading me stories just so I could like survive (laughs) because I was just so worried like if he was okay or not. So I just would want him to know hope I'd ask him if I could talk to him if he is feeling good and at peace and I would never want him to regret his decision because at the end of the day I want him to be at peace with everything he deserves that I feel like yeah I know that was a hard question I'm sorry any final last words do you feel like there's anything left unsaid that you really want to hit home I would just tell anybody that ever wanted to know or to talk to message me my inbox is always open I never would wish type of grief this whole experience on anybody or their family members and I think there's more to life that people just haven't seen yet that they they don't want to miss out on so yeah that would be my biggest thing I wish my dad could see a lot but he'll be watching from heaven I know that but like, of course, I would love for him to be able to be at my wedding, but stuff like that. So I would tell that to him. I, I suspect your wedding day is going to be very rainy in the morning and there's going to be a very nice rainbow in the afternoon. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Brianna, if people want to connect with you, not if, when they're ready to connect with you, what's your Instagram handle? Tell them. Brie Montague underscore. <laughs> like I said, no one ever be afraid to reach out to me. I know. I love talking to people, so. I mean, this is the best way to do it, to get a lot of ears listening to what went down. My heart broke for you when I read the post and it's still breaking today. In, in terms of all the milestones that you're going to be going through, you're going to be going through Christmas soon, you're going to be going through weddings, you're going to be going through babies, everything. And I know, I know it's going to be tough, but your dad is obviously going to be with you the whole time. So. I know this message is going to hit home for a lot of people and it takes a lot of vulnerability and strength to even talk about it. So I just want to thank you for doing that for everyone else. Thank you so much for having me on here. I appreciate it.